I'm going to say good morning because that's when I'm making this video. Uh, obviously, could depend on when you're viewing this video, but good morning everyone. As you can see, I'm in my Sunday finest here. Um, I am actually working from home. Um, and uh, this is my office slash gaming room. And I have my little gaming chair, gaming headset. Um, I need to get a new gaming chair one you know, that has all the uh, lumbar support and electronic stuff, but my wife won't for some reason let me buy that. Anyway, let's get into really the purpose of this video. So because of where we're at in the semester, and also based off of, again, some feedback that I've received, I want to take the time to first create a video that kind of reviews all of the rules for pad stacks and mounting holes and everything so you can have a video where it has all of that information as far as how to determine the size of things how to do the dimensions everything like that okay so let's first talk about just um, a general pad stack Now remember there's two types and we're going to first look at a through hole pad stack. And if we have a through hole pad stack, there's several things here that we have to consider. So I'm going to again do my best to draw these here. So we have a circle and this is going to be my hole that's drilled. And then around that circle, that's that hole that we drill, we have a copper pad. And so this is the copper pad. And then around that, we have, and I'll exaggerate the actual dimension here. We have a solder mask layer. But really what we want to think about is this would be my solder mask. But if you look at a finished board, really what's going to be is that this would all be green in here you know, green all the way over here. I'm not going to color any more in. And so that all you would see as far as exposed copper would be this copper pad. And the reason, again, if you're looking at a real board, there's going to be, you know, a copper trace that's connected. But that copper trace, again, will be covered over by the solder mask. And so this will look like bright copper and this won't even necessarily, it'll be, you know, not, might even not look like copper. It'll be a different, you know, kind of duller color. Okay. So that's kind of the basics of what information we need for it. So let's go ahead and write the formulas down here again um, to make sure that we have them all clear because I had made a mistake in a previous video. So let's write them down and make sure we all have them correct, including me. Okay, so first off, we need to know what the hole size is to drill. Well, the hole size we want to drill, um, D is what I'll say for the diameter, is going to be the maximum lead diameter. plus 0.25 for level A and I'm not going to rewrite the whole thing down here I'll just do it in red plus 0.2 instead if it's level B so when I'm saying plus 0.2 obviously what I mean is we don't do the 0.25, we do the 0.2 instead. And then for level C, um, 
it's 0.15. And now that has to do with the density of components on the board. And it has to do with um, whether level A is the least dense, level B is you know moderate dense, um, and level C is high density. And we've done some examples of this, but like the reality is like a motherboard is a low density um, board. Um, a cell phone is a high density board. Um, but a lot of other boards, um, I'm just trying to think, um, I don't know if I would want to say a tablet is uh, medium density, but medium density is honestly kind of, quote, a default that a lot of people use as the medium density um, boards um, as far as when creating a pad stack. But remember, we said in this class, unless otherwise specified, we're going to assume level A density because we are going to be doing ourselves when we create our layouts and even when we get to soldering some things here we are going to be doing low density boards so that's why we are using level a in this course because we're going to be always doing low density boards and density doesn't refer to as a side note it doesn't refer to the number of components it refers to the number of components within a specific area of the board because you can have a high density board that maybe only has a hundred components and you can have a low density board that has a thousand components um, and it all depends on the size of the board so um, next thing we need besides the hole drill size is we need to know the copper pad size And to get the copper pad size, remember we have kind of the three um, levels here. So I'll say the um, pad size is equal to my hole diameter that I'm drilling plus, uh, instead of using that D here, let's just write it out so that we're very clear here. The pad size is equal to my um, whole drill size plus 0.1 plus 0.6 and that's for level A. And then for level B, it's plus 0.1 plus 0.5. And for level C, let me scroll up a little bit here. For level C, it is plus 0.1 plus Point four for level C. Now another way you can think of this um, is because we always have that point one, so we could do this pad size is equal to the whole drill size. plus 0.7 plus 0.6 or plus 0.4 depending I'm sorry not 0 0.4 0 0.5 and that's because I clearly just added the 0.1 to all of those and I didn't rewrite the level A B and C down now the third piece of information that we need to define a through hole pad stack is we need the solder mask. And now, here, let me go to this picture here. This solder mask area, this distance right here,
0.07 millimeters. And remember, you're going to have another one on the other side. So the way you can think of it is the solder mask. And it doesn't matter what level of density that you're at. So it doesn't matter if you're level A, B, or C for this, is that you're going to do your pad size plus 0.14 millimeters. So this particular equation for the solder mask is independent of the density of components. All right, now moving on with this, we have a naming convention that we use for these types of pad stacks. And again, these are now uploaded to our Blackboard site. They're in PDFs under naming conventions. There's really two types of ones we're going to use for through hole. Um, I mean, technically, you can make more shapes than just this, but we're going to do just two here. Is we're going to do um, a circle or a square. And so if we're doing a, a circle, we start this with C, and then we do the pad size first. So pad size. And then we do a lowercase h. Actually, everything's lowercase always in the naming conventions. h. And then we actually do the drill hole size. Now, there are other options you can add on to this, depending if you're doing a more complicated pad stack, but we're not going to be doing those in this class. Remember, this is just an introduction to this. So this is how we would name a circular pad with a hole. Now, if we want the pad to be a square instead of the hole, and we'll, again, I'll remind you why we want to do that. We want it to be a square. We just start with an S, and then we do pad size H drill hole size. And this is a square pad with a hole. And why we sometimes want that, remember, is that, for instance, if I have a chip here, and let's just say this chip has six pins on it, only because that's what I drew here. The way this numbering always goes is if there's going to be like some either cutout or maybe there's a dot in the top left of it you know there's some mark to indicate basically where the top is and then top left here this is always going to be pin one two and then three and then they go straight across four five six that's always how they number the pins and so by having uh, a square and this is again assuming that this is some kind of what we call dual inline package so this is still a through hole component and the way you can tell it if you took a side view of this, you'd have the component here, and then the leads would be kind of right here, but then they'd be going down, you know, quite far, you know, when you're looking at the mechanical drawings. This is kind of what it would look like. And that, you know, is indicating that's a through hole component. And then, of course, they'd give us the dimensions of that. But this is making sure so that when we place the component either manually or automatically, that we know where to how to rotate it to put it in properly so that we don't damage the chip or damage other components or we don't have you know something quote unquote blow up on us
Now, to finish up with the pad stacks, maybe I should have started with this, let's remind ourselves that the pins can have different shapes. You can have a round pin. That's actually very uncommon um, with chips. This tends to be for what I'd call axial components. So these are going to be like resistors, capacitors, and inductors, typically. And it's not that re that's what you call resistors. It's not that a resistor isn't an axial component. It's just those are the typical components that are in that type of package. They're in an axial package. And so those have those round pins for us. But all the other packages typically either have, most commonly we've seen, is where they have um, this um, rectangle or square. And then remember, we want to find the maximum diameter in all of these. So we want to find the maximum diameter. And I'm going to just go ahead and just draw it here. So the maximum diameter for the circle is easy. That's just the diameter of the circle. But then for these other two, it's the diagonals, which is what we call our maximum diameter. And if I label these here, I label this A and B, and then I'm going to just label this side X here. We can get this diagonal here diag dia for diagonal would just be the square root of A squared plus B squared. And that's just using Pythagorean's theorem. And then for the square, um, it's actually just the diagonal is equal to x times the square root of 2. Now, you can get that from Pythagorean's theorem as well, um, but that's what you get when you use Pythagorean's theorem, as you get that it would be x times the square root of 2. Or, you know, a real quick way as a side note, it's an over approximation. But if you have a squared one, an over approximation that you can really quickly get a rough idea of what it would be is multiply it by 1.5 because square root of 2 is 1.414. So, yeah, 1.5 is bigger than 1.414, but you can see 1.5, yeah, we're only off by a tenth, and it's really easy to multiply something by 1.5, in my opinion. You just take half of it and add it to the number, right? Um, where, of course, we have calculators. To, to do the other computations, but you know it's nice little tricks like that are sometimes always good to keep in mind. Um, you know if you're out on the floor or something and you don't have a calculator right by you or something like that. Okay, so that is my pad stack for a through hole. We also have the pad stack for a surface mount. Now, what I should tell you here, and maybe I didn't make this clear enough, but we are typically you don't do any computations. Because all of the data sheets we've looked at actually have this what they call land pattern layout. And it gives the size of the pad in there. And most of these are rounded rectangles. And I said there's actually a reason for that. And it has to do with conductivity and things of that nature um, and resistance, but you know, beyond the scope of this course. Um, but we typically don't do any computations for these. So instead, what we're doing is we're looking at the data sheet. values. 
Now, let me star something here. You know, surface mount have no holes. And again, another video um, that I posted um, and I sent you an email about has um, the uh, further explanation on how you can tell surface mount from a uh, through hole component. And so again, if you're looking at the profile of it, if I'm looking at the chip from like the side, for instance, so like this would be, this would be like the top of the chip. The pins are going to look something like this coming out. And that, and you see how they're bent and they don't go below the bottom of this component. This is for something to be mounted on the surface. So that's how I would know that I need a surface mount pad as opposed to a through hole pad. And then you would go to where the land patterns are. And on the slight chance you don't have a land pattern, um, you know, I'd say honestly just email me and I can help you with that on how you handle it if you don't have a land pattern. But all of the data sheets I'm going to be posting for us to do are going to have those land patterns because honestly that's predominantly what they do. I, um, there's only rarely been a data sheet where they don't have that information already specified for you. Okay, so then we also have a naming convention and it, it, it's slightly different than what I originally told you, um, but it's in the, the um, PDF with naming conventions. So for a surface mount, we are going to do R for rectangular, because that's what it normally is. And, you know, with the way that we kind of define it in the pad stack editor, we will do width um, underscore height. Now, since these are typically rounded rectangles, um, so I'll just leave this here. Let me actually stop for a second and say, if it was a true rectangle, we are done. There's nothing else we need to do um, unless it's um, true, if this is a true rectangle. But as we said, most of the pads are rounded rectangles. And for a rounded rectangle, you do R width underscore height another R, and this is standing for um, rounded, and then radius, and this is the radius of the round. And this is actually typically 0.05 millimeters. I, I mean, I'm sure we can find examples where it's not, but uh, for most components that we'll be looking at, it's 0.05 millimeters. So then when doing these, there is also a solder mask as well. The solder mask width is pad width plus it's the same rule 0.14 millimeters because you got 0.07 all the way around 
and then solder mask height. Pad height. plus 0.14 millimeters. Okay, so that's our pad stacks. Now let's talk about the mounting holes and vias. So the via, first off, um, we should say here, I should maybe emphasize the minimum diameter according to specs is typically 0.25 millimeters. For us it is 0.3 millimeters again because of drill bit sizes. But when we actually start using vias to actually build boards that we are going to actually solder together, um, like some projects where you're going to do a layout for a board um, and then assemble it and everything, um, we're going to have the via be a larger via if we need vias. Um, again, because 0.3 millimeters, are, it's really hard. You have to be very careful so that the drill bit doesn't break. And then also on top of that, um, we don't have a way to plate that hole currently. And oh, you can't really find wires very easily that are thin enough to go through there and solder them such that you don't just burn the wire up as you're trying to solder them. So we make them a little bit bigger so that you can stick what's called a breadboard wire through them and solder them on the top and the bottom, um, you know, so that it's uh, a little bit easier to um, get the via connection made. All right. Now, remember, if we are actually trying to determine the radius of a via or the diameter of a via, we have this trace width here. So I have this trace coming from a component or somewhere. You know, so this is a copper trace, and you know, and again, it might be, I'll do a well, I don't want to do a rounded. You know, and it might come here. And there might be a via right here, actually. And, you know, trace might continue on and everything else like that. So, um, the general rule of thumb is that we make the via, so this would be my via here. And remember, a via connects different layers of the board, like it connects the top side of the board to the bottom side of the board. The radius of that via, I don't want to do radius, we're always talking about diameters here. Diameter is going to be equal to the width of the trace divided by pi. And the reason for this is that we set circumference of via equal to width of trace. And so we do that. And then when we have that for the via, we can determine the width of the via uh, the diameter of the via, and this is the whole size diameter, let me emphasize. And then we also need the pad, um, copper pad size. 
but the copper pad size is actually typically um, two or three times the whole diameter. And we often are using the three times. The sometimes the reason you wouldn't use the three times is again could be because of um, space in everything as far as density of the board. But in general, in this class, we're going to use the three times the whole diameter. Now there's going to still be a solder mask for these as well, but the solder mask. This is no different than like the through hole pad component. It's just the purpose is not to put a component here. It's to make a connection from the top and the bottom, but it's a still it's still a hole with a copper pad. Um, and so it's going to need uh, a solder mask on it as well. Um, and the solder mask would be the copper pad size. plus 0.14 millimeters. Okay. Then for vias, the only thing we have for naming for vias is we start them with a V and then we do pad size and then H hole size. Now there's a lot of other parameters like you can there's a lot of things you can append to the end of this you know for complex things like it's a via that connects layers one through three together and stuff like that. We're not going to do that in this class that's again for a more advanced course and routing or quite frankly if you got an internship doing PCB layout you would learn some of that in, in your internship as well. Um, which as a side note companies are desperate for people who can do layouts. Um, people you know, honestly, typically are not trained in doing these layouts anymore in college and people are retiring and everything. So a lot of companies are desperate for people um, to who can do layouts. Now, of those, those would be companies that, of course, are designing circuit boards and everything else like that. Electrical engineering is a very broad area of engineering. So there's there's lots of areas that, you know, if you went into the power sector, they wouldn't want someone who could do layouts for boards, but, you know, all depends on what you're going to be doing. Now, the last type of hole here that I want to review for us is then the mounting hole. Now, I know we talked about plated versus unplated holes. Um, for the rest of the semester, and we did it in the homework, but for the rest of the semester, anytime we make a mounting hole, we're going to be making a plated mounting hole. Um, it's just from my practice, I've always ever, I've always just used plated mounting holes because even if you don't want the mounting hole like connected to ground, like because you're not trying to ground anything, I mean, you, you can still use a plated mounting hole. You just, it just doesn't connect to anything then, you know. And to me, it's just, it's, it, it makes more sense. I'm sure there's reasons to, you know, not use the plating because um, maybe it saves a fraction of a penny on manufacturing. And when you're doing thousands, you know, that actually does turn into savings. But um, from my own personal experience, um, I always just use plated mounting holes. Now, I know in the homework, I had you do both plated and unplated. But that's because I wanted you to have some practice in doing both plated and unplated. But we are um, going to, for now on, always do plated mounting holes. And so the plated mounting holes, well, 
the diameter of the mounting hole is refer I'm not going to rewrite it out here refer to table in notes and I'm not even going to scroll up here but on this set of notes because I'd have to scroll back up pretty far I had it where it was like the screw size like there was like number one number two and then I had the M size like where it's like you know an M2 an M3 an M4 and then I had off to there like what's the whole size that you should drill so you're basically just looking it up on a table there are, there are no computations to do for a mounting hole and you might say well what if I have a different type of bolt or something well the reality is is the odds of you having a different type of bolt are fairly negligible because we're talking about circuit boards and you know some of those bolts are pretty large so the on, honestly the only thing it could encounter is having ones that would be smaller and you'd only encounter those again in an industry application and that would be through an internship or a job and I will let you know the company explain how they handle those um, so we're going to refer to the table in the notes that gets me my drill hole size now the copper pad size There's a couple ways to determine the copper pad size. Um, what I had explained and did in the videos um, was finding this, um, you know, I'll say here, first method. Bolt head size. So what's the size of the head of the bolt that's going to be used? Um, and so, you know, I'm going to do a really bad side drawing here. So if you got a bolt here, you know, you've got, you know, it's going to look something like this, right? And then, you know, the threads for the bolt are like right there. And so, you know, this is going to be what's going to be flush against the board. Uh, these areas. Oh, I want a little low. So like these areas here. Those are what are going to be flush to the board. And so for this here, um, we just simply look at what's this diameter or measurement there. And we use the copper pad size in this case. Here, actually, let me do it this way. Uh, there we go. Copper pad size. And let's have this, then it would be equal to D plus 0.7 for level A. 0.6. Level B, 0.5, level C. And that's just going back and literally doing the exact same thing here. Because we have um, the diameter of the head and then we want it to be a little bit bigger. And so we're using the same standards for um, a normal pad that you would be drilling the hole through. Okay, well then there's another method, second method, washer. And you don't see this as much anymore because typically the washer is built into the bolt um, typically for these types of applications um, but some boards you'll still see where they'll put a washer and so they'll have a, a washer my hole's not very centered there 
No, it's not much better, but it's a little bit better. You'll have a washer, and then you'll have your bolt going through it. So let's do another side view here. So I'm going to draw the bolt again. So here's the bolt. Let me draw it a little bit bigger there on that side just because. Make it a little bit more symmetric. And now it's a little over. I'm not going to fuss it. And then what I'm saying by a washer is that maybe we have a washer that's underneath this bolt. So this is a washer. And then this would be the actual board. Okay, so if you're using a washer, which I didn't specify in the homework, so, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be something you would do for this one, of course. But if you had a washer that was specified that was going to be used, then you would take uh, you would take the diameter of the washer of the, of course of the larger circle um, to do your copper pad. So if I called this dot um, my diameter d, then I would just do the copper pad is equal to D plus 0.7 for level A dot dot dot. I'm not going to write it all down again. It's basically the exact same equation up here. It's just I had been given a washer instead, so that's what I'd be using. Now, as I said, for a lot of boards nowadays, they don't typically have washers um, as well with them because well, the reason being is is that you take the bolt, if you're like taking the board out, you take the bolt off and then suddenly there's this washer that's loose and flopping around and then no, oh, it goes underneath something and you can't, you know, pain in the butt. So, but you'll still see some boards that use washers, not very many. The final method, which is the method that I think some of you um, might use, And this is, to me, would be third method, and this is given no inf given no information or unable to find head size. We're just going to do the copper pad diameter equals whole diameter times three. Quite frankly, what we do for the via, that's what we're going to do for the mounting hole. But now, for the naming convention for uh, mounting hole, we just do W for a uh, mounting hole, and then we do copper pad, and then H hole size. And so those are the pad sex. In fact, um, aside from the fiducials, which um, we had one fiducial we're going to do, which I'm not going to go through the fiducials again here. Um, but aside from that, aside from fiducial, um, 
those are all of the pad stacks we'll be using. Okay, so relatively long video here, much longer than I normally make them, but I wanted to make one video that kind of summarized all of the pad stack information that we're going to need for the rest of the semester. So if you if you forget something, you have one place to go to look for it, and you don't have to, you know, say, well, what week did I we learn this thing, or what week did we do that, and we have one space for it.